here for, for Renee. And the committee who did a phenomenal. Hey, what's that? How are you? Everything good at home? Yeah, that's it. We'll, we'll have a conversation later. Um, I am excited. I don't know which side of the room to stand on. Which side is better? You guys over there have to catch it. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about addiction in the framework of trauma and also how it plays out in this wonderful place we live in called Long Island. I grew up here. Um, so I call it Affluence, Alienation, and Addiction. I was like, oh, I should write a book with that title. But that takes a lot of work. Here's where I grew up. Anybody here from Northport? Well, I knew Renee was. Yeah, anybody else? You know Northport. It's like a lot of towns on Long Island. It's really nice. It's very idyllic. Um, and uh, that's a recent photo. And uh, it's got this nice little main street that goes down by the water. It's, it's interesting because I grew up in Northport. I just want to mention my positionality really quickly. I am a white, male, uh, cisgendered, heterosexual, born middle class. Grew up with a whole lot of privilege that I did not know that I had. Right? So it's an evolution for me. If I say anything completely idiotic, because of my positionality, please gently feel free to push back. But I think it's important to understand, I grew up in North Park, North Park was, and, and is a mostly white town, although it's more diverse now. Um, this is a place a lot of people would want to live, right? Really pretty town, right by the harbor. They shot movies here. Sherry. Oh, right. And, um, and that's great, but I want to share my understanding of trauma and addiction through the lens of an event that happened in Northport a few decades ago. If people remember a murder that happened in the 1980s in Northport, anybody remember that? It was called the Satanic Killing, right? Um, this is Gary Lowers at the age of 17. He was brutally murdered by his friend, Ricky Casso. Okay, so for those that don't remember this, you can look it up. Um, there's been a whole bunch of little documentaries made on it and some songs written about it. But uh, this rocked not only Northport, but the entire nation. Like, I remember when this happened, there were news outlets from around the globe in Northport trying to find out what happened. There was supposedly a satanic cult. Right? Um, and my, I, I knew then, and I was really young, that they're missing the point, that there was a lot more going on, and the news sensationalized it in a way that they tend to do. But I think they really missed the point, and I kind of want to unpack this a little and talk a little bit about how living in this wonderful place that we live in, Long Island, uh, can actually contribute to some of these really negative tragedies that happen. Um, recently, there was a book that came out about a year and a half ago called The Acid King. It was written by a guy named Jesse Pollock. And although a book was written about this murder 30 years ago, he really wanted to get the real story because that book was very sensationalized decades ago. And I was one of the people interviewed for it. He interviewed a lot of people that were there. And I recommend, if you're interested, to kind of unpack it, to check this book out. Um, and some of the clips that I'm going to show you are from a documentary that he has put together. And some of the footage is actually interviews with people at the time after it had come out. So I, I think that will be helpful um, in understanding what's going on. I keep meeting people in the first thing we talk about, we're on the same age, is 
so. Remember Ricky Castle? Sure do. A Long Island, New York couple said today that it was the devil, drugs, and rock and roll that led their son to ritual murder. Satanism, Judas Priest, give me a break, right? 17-year-old Richard Castle was accused of murdering another 17-year-old, Jerry Lowers, in what police called a sacrificial killing. Nobody messes with the acid king. They claimed he was high on mescaline when he was arrested. The wall between fantasy and reality is slowly gonna like start to like fade, you know. Police believe that members of a devil worship cult, Knights of the Black Circle, took flowers to a wooded area in Northport, New York. They just dragged a kid into the woods here in Northport. Casho and a group of friends performed a bizarre ritual, stabbing Lauer, burning articles of his clothing, and cutting out his eyes. What the fuck is going on in the suburbs, man? Casho would accuse Lauer of stealing drugs. Angel dust was stolen, and like it became this contentious thing. It wasn't like 50 hits of acid, it was like angel dust, and the guy was like fucked up out of his mind. Well, drugs played an important part in young Casso's life, and so apparently did the devil. That was the golden age of Satan. In the park where the group congregated, there was Satanistic graffiti. Well, they would build a fire and sit around the fire and, uh, and take a, an animal, a dog usually, and uh, torture it to death. In the town I grew up in, we would not have had those kids. Richard Casso was awaiting trial on a charge of opening a 19th century grave. He needed a skull for this ritual he was going to do. Long Island in the 80s was a pretty weird place. Satanism provided the method for the murder, if not the motive. Neighbors are scared that these devil worshippers they take their tea next. I mean, the 80s were fucking stupid, man. It was as though the devil was an actual entity hanging out at the 7-Eleven on the corner, hanging out in some kids' rooms. Ricky, like, wasn't like an occultist. He just, like, you know, carried around a satanic Bible. He couldn't even spell Satan. Right? Richard Katzo was a dropout, a drifter, and a drug user and dealer. So, I knew these kids. And I could tell you this. There wasn't a satanic cult in Northport. But there was a lot of things going on that I would like to share with you because I think it shaped my journey and entry into the field of social work because it's one of the things, this event, that inspired me to become a social worker. But it also shows where we as a society get things wrong and kind of look at the wrong stuff and what we really need to be working at. So, um, when you see a picture of this baby, what kind of pops into your mind? Not, not me. The, the, the baby. Google image, white kid. By the way, when you Google search cute baby, white ones come up. Google's a little racist. We have to just throw that in there. Um, so how does a baby with all this potential, think about this, everything that child could be. They could be a prosecutor. They could be a teacher. They could be... Uh, a social worker, they could be a plumber, they could be an artist, they could be an architect. How does a child with all that potential turn into somebody like Ricky, who at the age of 17 brutally murdered his friend? I mean, and I won't go into the details, but it was bad, right? How does that happen? So for the longest time, we've been told a whole bunch of things like, well, maybe he grew up with addiction because I mean, drugs were a big part of Ricky's life, especially in his teenage years. Maybe he grew up with violence. I mean, and all those things contribute. But most people who grow up with addiction in the home, they don't end up like that. Maybe it was genetic. Maybe it was born that way. And that, that's something that people say with a lot of compassion. Like, we want to help people. You know, that genetically, something's different about them. We want to make sure we can do what we can for them. But that also doesn't tell most of the story. So I, I kind of want to unpack it. Remember him as being Check this out like first. Joe Average back then. I mean, he had the plaid shirt, the new jeans, you know, the tan boots. He was skinny, and he was he was not the biggest guy at that time. And I don't think he was bullied, but I don't think that people really thought of him as any kind of a threat in any way. There was no difference between like he or I at that point. There were no. No warning signs, no triggers, nothing that you would say, oh, this one day might be an issue. So this is just to present that Ricky had a fairly, from the outside, normal-looking childhood. How many people here are educators, work in schools? Right? This is a kid that wouldn't have been on your radar when he was seven, eight, nine years old if you worked in an elementary school. Maybe even in the beginning of his um, 
elementary school to transition to middle school or junior high, which is what they called it back then years, still wouldn't have been on your radar, right? Um, average kid, not excelling, but not really doing too poorly either, and behaviorally kind of just fitting in the mix there. So how does a child with potential, like every kid has when they're born, turn into somebody who ends up becoming addicted to very you know, dangerous substances and causing so much pain for an individual, his family, and for the community? How does that happen? Uh, how many people here have heard of the ACEs study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study? So I think that, that side of the room won again. I don't know, I don't know what's happening. I'll spend time with you guys in a little bit. This is good though. When I ask people about the ACEs study, I will tell you vastly the majority of the audience never raises their hands. Don't worry if you haven't heard of it. Um, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study started over 20 years ago by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And what they wanted to do, two things. They wanted to find out what's the prevalence of trauma, potentially traumatic events, sexual abuse, physical abuse, things like that, in the lives of children, and also what effect might that have on their health and on their behavior throughout their lives. So the CDC looked at a sample group of 17,000 adults and they asked them a series of questions to determine if any of the following things happened to them. Were they physically abused? Were they psychologically abused? Were they sexually abused? Were they emotionally or physically neglected? Did they grow up with addiction? Did they grow up with mental illness? Right? They found out 22% of adults surveyed, the average age was 50, 22% of adults said they were sexually abused before they reached the age of 18. 28% they said they were physically abused. More than one in four grew up with an addicted person in their home. Almost one in five grew up having a parent abandon them. Many of them grew up with domestic violence. Some of them had an incarcerated family member. But the bottom line was we found out that two-thirds of the population have at least one of these things. A third of us don't have any, which is nice. It's kind of like winning the birth lottery. You get a zero there. Doesn't mean your life is perfect. 27% of us have a score of three or more where they said yes. Three of these 10 things did happen. And 16% of us have a score of four or more. So the question is, so what? What does that mean? Well, what it means is they were able to look at the health records of all these people and find out that after having gone through multiple traumatic events in childhood, there was a significant correlation in the risk for a whole bunch of bad health outcomes. Here's the ACE study in, in relation to depression. This is diagnosable depression. Go to a doctor, get diagnosed, get a pill. If your ACE score is zero, you said, no, none of these things happen to me, there's a very low risk for having ma uh, major depressive disorder. But if your ACE score is three, you have double the risk for depression. If your ACE score is four, it's even higher or above. Ricky was diagnosed with depression. He was diagnosed with a whole bunch of things, but he was definitely diagnosed with major depressive disorder. So if you've heard that depression is genetic, that's not really telling most of the story. What we know from these studies is that our experiences as children, there's a whole bunch of other factors, but our experience growing up is the number one factor in determining whether or not we are going to be diagnosed with depression as an adult. The lead researcher of the study, Dr. Vincent Felitti, said, what if depression isn't a pathology? What if it's a response to toxic environments? So using the case of Ricky Casso, I can tell you that at 13 years old, he was kicked out of his house for the first time, one of many, many times. This was a kid who lived in the woods, who lived in sheds behind his friend's houses. Now, you can't kick your child out of the house. Now, couldn't do it then either. But I mean, if you did that now, you'd hopefully, if that came to the attention of the appropriate authorities, there'd, you know, there'd be a family court case, maybe even a criminal court case around that. But this is what happened. The year, by the way, was 1984. 
when the when the murder happened. But this is, you know, at 13 years old, being kicked out of your house, right? That can cause things like that. So your response to those things that happen to you might be diagnosed as like depression or anxiety or you know, oppositional defiant disorder. But if we just look at the behavior of the kid, think about some of the kids you're working with or you've worked with. If you just look at the behavior of the children in front of you and don't know the backstory, because often they don't come to us and say, here's what's happening in my home, here's you know, my history, we have to guess. It is not a crazy assumption to guess that kids who present with these behaviors and these diagnoses probably have been through a lot. I know Ricky when he came back from court, from when he, uh, when he went to court to dig in the grave. My father drove him there in his red Corvette. And on the way home, Ricky asked his father for a quarter. And uh, Ricky's like, you know, I just want a quarter. I want to go get something to eat. And he hasn't eaten in three days, right? You know, he can get a bagel from the next door to the midway for like 30 cents. And his father said no. And he kicked his father's door. You know, his father left. He went to the midway. His father came back like a half an hour later, gave him $2, tell him never to call his house, talk to his mother or his sisters again, and he never wanted to see him again when his father just threw the money at him and said, don't ever come back to the house. You're not part of the family anymore. What did, what did he have? What did he have at that point to live for? That, that was one of many times he had been kicked out. As the scene was, and friends witnessed this, that he had gone to court because he had broken into a cemetery ostensibly trying to steal a skull. Right? And his father drove him to court, Suffolk County, uh, and then on the way back, dropped him off at the deli. And next to the deli in Northport was this place called the Midway. The Midway was a head shop, and it sold paraphernalia for use of drugs. So dropped him off there and said, um, wouldn't give him any money. And Ricky asked his dad for money so he could buy a bagel because he hadn't eaten in three days. And then the father came back a half hour later and threw $2 at him and said, never call us again. You're out of the family. Right? Now, I get that when a kid, and you, you've seen some of these, unfortunately, is causing the level of chaos, families have to be firm and draw the line. But I want to talk a little bit more about the history here, because I think it's important. We look at the ACE study. People with an ACE score of four or more, and by the way, it doesn't matter what for traumas you suffered as a child. If your ACE score, if your adverse childhood experience, if your trauma score is four or more, if you said, I suffered sexual abuse, physical abuse, my mother was an alcoholic, my father left when I was 11, didn't matter which four it was, in combination, you're 10 times more likely to attempt suicide if your ACE score is four or more. Ricky attempted suicide multiple times. Ultimately, suicide took his life after he was arrested and put in jail in Suffolk County for the murder of his childhood friend, Gary Lowers. Here's the connection between adverse childhood experiences and alcoholism. If your trauma score is zero, fewer than five in 100 people with a score of zero become alcoholic as adult. Your risk doubles with exposure to just one thing. That one thing could be witnessing domestic violence. So just understand and especially people who work in education, when you have a child who talks about witnessing domestic violence or being exposed to domestic violence in the home, that's not only a crime against the parent who is a victim, it's a crime against those children as well. Nassau County District Attorney's Office is one of the most progressive DA's offices when it comes to dealing with these cases. And it's Really important to understand that domestic violence affects more people than just that, that victim. But when you're growing up with that, that could double your risk for alcoholism. And your risk goes up exponentially with each additional category of abuse and trauma that you might be exposed to. Even if the kid themselves is not directly vi victimized by physical abuse, just knowing it's going on in a house, 
to be detrimental and raise the risk. I mean, the average age in the ACE study of the people they talked to was 50 years old. So these are people whose lives have been affected by what happened when they were 10, when they were 11, when they were 12. Even opioid crisis on Long Island, right? And throughout the state and throughout the nation. Suffolk County. You know, they, stopped, they stopped putting these numbers out. But the last year, a few years ago, when they put these numbers out, Suffolk County was the number one county for opioid overdose deaths in New York State. Nassau County wasn't far behind. But we live in nice places, right? How could this be the case? Interestingly, heroin is one of the most effective painkillers known in medicine. If you know anyone that's had a knee or a hip operation, they've had heroin. But they don't call it heroin. If you yourself have had those, they don't call it heroin in hospitals. In America, they call it diamorphine. Diamorphine is heroin. Why do most people who are exposed to this drug in a medical setting not become addicted? Right? Because we're told it's an addictive drug. If you get exposed to it on a daily basis, you're going to become addicted. And the reality is that's not exactly true. Something else has to be present. And here's what we know. When a person who is susceptible to addiction, somebody who has grown up and lived with trauma in their lives, especially multiple traumas, is exposed to a potentially addictive substance like heroin, they are far more likely to become addicted than just anybody who doesn't have a trauma history. And that's what the evidence shows. Interestingly, the part of your brain that lights up when you are exposed to physical pain is the same part that lights up when you're exposed to mental and emotional pain. Literally, broken ankles and broken hearts stimulate the same part of the brain. They feel different. Think about the life that Ricky had. There is a, a, an excerpt in the book, The Acid King, that talks about when, Licky, uh, when Ricky was living in, um, in the woods behind his friend's house. And his father found him and beat him so badly that the friend <coughs> down the hill from the woods, his father heard it and turned to his son and said, one day we're going to see that kid hanging from a tree. Okay. Now you could write this off and say, well, this is an anomaly. right? This is like this one weird case. But I'm letting you know the connection between trauma, addiction, and violence is well supported by silence. By silence. Hopefully not by silence. We're asking you to look at addiction the same way that we're asking you to look at <clears throat> mental illness, such as depression. That instead of just this thing that exists out of nowhere, that it's literally something that is a response to an injury from the environment. Right now, there are people who are terrified. Like, what you're doing right now, sitting in a group of people, is terrifying for some people who have you know, serious problems socializing and connecting with people. So they have to pre-medicate before it. Right? So addiction, we have to look at it, what purpose it serves in the lives of those who are living with it. It's not a bad choice. I mean, sometimes the criminal justice system, I mean, it's set up by laws that were created by people, and people make mistakes. Sometimes the criminal justice system responds to drug and alcohol abuse is like, you made a bad choice. And I think choice is a really, I want to unpack the idea of choice a little bit. Right? Choice is, it's subjective. Like, I made the choice to wear a bow tie today. I tie my own bow ties, which I think, hey, how's it going? Nice to see. Um, I tie my own bow ties, by the way, so that's important. It's a skill I've learned. As I get older, there's very little I can do to change my appearance. I could shave or not shave, wear a bow tie, shower. That's kind of really <laughs> did all of those things today. But is waking up at 2 AM on a Wednesday night uh, morning and doing crystal meth, is that a choice? I mean, ostensibly it is. And one must be responsible for the actions they commit. But we have to look at the whole picture. 
When you think of the kids you're working with, those that are the most difficult, those that zap your attention and take most of your energy. And I will let you know, almost always those kids are coming from homes where there's chaos. They did a study um, some years back called Rat Park. There was ex these experiments that were done with rats in the 1970s, and they took a rat and they put it in a cage. And um, they, uh, it had a, a sugar water bottle, and it could drink the water bottle, or next to it was a sugar water bottle that had either cocaine or opioids in it. And almost every time the rat chose the drug water and did it over and over until it became addicted. And there was a partnership for a Drug Free America commercial about this. Does anybody remember it with the little rat running around in the cage? The first partnership for, what is that? <laughs> oh my God, the rat dies in the commercial. But the first partnership for Drug Free America commercial was not very scary. That was the one with the fried egg on the, on the frying pan. Do you remember that one? And they would be, they'd look at the egg and they would say, this is your brain. And then the frying pan, they were like, this is drugs. And they would crack the egg on it and say, this is your brain on drugs. Hoping that it would make people not want to do drugs. But I know that if you were getting high on like a Friday night and this commercial comes on at like 1 a.m., you're not thinking of going to rehab, you're thinking of going to the diner. So they recalibrated and they said, we need a scarier commercial. And that's when they put the rats in cages commercial up. And literally, it was kind of heartbreaking. It showed the rat running around in circles, all coked up, because they kept doing the drug water over and over, and then eventually having cardiac arrest and dying. I mean, a rat. So scientists concluded that means that if you're exposed to drugs that are readily available, you will develop an addiction. Because cocaine is an extremely potentially addictive substance. What it does to the brain, floods it with dopamine, chemically. It's really, really intense. So these scientists from Canada said this is a flawed experiment. And the reason it was flawed was because rats are social animals. And when you, social, when you isolate a rat in a cage all by itself with nothing to do and give it the option of doing drugs, drugs it'll do them every time. So they wanted to test the theory. So they built Rat Park, which was a beautiful place. If you were a rat, you wanted to be in Rat Park. Rat Park was gorgeous. It had wood chips on the floor. It had the little things to run on because they like running on the little wheels. And it had other rats where they could socialize as groups because that's how rats live. They could even have rat sex and make rat babies. And they did. I bet you didn't think you were going to hear the phrase rat sex today. <laughs> it's your lucky day. They had a sugar water bottle at the end that contained either cocaine or opioids. Very f many of the rats tried it once. Very few tried it more than once. None of them became addicted, and none of them overdosed and died. There's an excellent TED talk on this by a guy named Johan Hari, H-A-R-I called Everything You Think You Know About Addiction Is Wrong. And he says this quote that I love. He says, it's not the drug, it's your cage. If your cage is, that's a half hour? Perfect. If your cage is a really loving environment, right? You're going to grow up to your fullest potential, but if your gate cage is defined by fear and abuse and terror, like Ricky's was, that's a completely different story. There's a, a guy named Gabor Mate, M-A-T-E. If you want to learn about substance abuse, read this guy or watch his videos on YouTube, M-A-T-E, Mate. He wrote a book called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. He's a doctor. He works to this day. For decades, he's been doing it. But to this day, he works in Vancouver with people whose lives have been devastated by addiction to heroin, addiction to crystal meth and cocaine. He said he interviewed a young woman who eventually, sadly, died of an overdose of heroin. And she said, doctor, 
the first time I tried heroin, I remember one thing, that it felt like a warm, soft hug. So here's the thing. Literally, in our brain, we have these little receptors called endorphin receptors. And they get stimulated when a whole bunch of things happen. One of the things that stimulates endorphin receptors is love. When an infant child is looking into the eyes of their parent, their mother, their father, their grandparent, whoever's caring for them, those receptors get flooded with endorphins. It feels good for that child to the point that the child starts to crave it. So then when a little baby you know, is in the room and the parent comes in, they raise their hands up when they're able to do that because they want to hug, they want to hold, they want to be loved and tended to. But what if you don't have that growing up? Attachment is so important. And listen, you're working in schools. You, you can't go turn the clock back with these kids and, and fix what happened to them. But I'm letting you know a lot of the people that are the biggest problems for educators, for prosecutors, because you know if they don't solve their problems in school, they're going to grow up and they're going to become problems in the community. Most of these people, I know because I've worked with them, have horrible stories to tell. Suffered years of not feeling connected to a family. Like, I feel I'm lucky, right? I'm adopted, by the way. I was adopted at three months old by a family. I think like, what would have happened if, if that wasn't the way it turned out? You know, and my brother and I both adopted like, by parents who loved us and wanted us and kind of like, I just thought that was normal. Hmm. Did not have a perfect life growing up. But I knew that I was loved and wanted. And I felt that my community was connected to me. I, I just kind of like natural assumptions. People that are engaged in gang violence, people that are engaged in drug use, often don't have that experience. So one of the hardest things I, I had to learn about my privilege was not everybody grew up like I grew up. You know, and that that's not that's kind of not the reality that I saw. It was almost like they had a whole separate culture out there. Human beings have an inborn need to attach. Kids are born with the genetic programming to seek out attachment to a caregiver. But here's the thing, 12 year olds are not really good at being a moral compass for other 12 year olds. No, and, and, and this is how things progress. So then the adults throw their hands up and they go, oh, it must be the heavy metal music. It must be the Satanism. It must be all of that. And, uh, and, and it's none of those things, right? Our experiences make us who we are. People who grow up with loving families, who are connected, who feel a sense of ownership and belonging in their community, usually don't end up the last thing I said is people that grow up with a sense of loving uh, families and, and a belonging and a connection to their community usually don't end up murdering and mutilating their friends. And by the way, playing clips of myself is easier, so this way I don't have to talk the entire time. <laughs> I'm like, should I put them in? Okay, but all right, it's as far as it goes. So this is the reality. People aren't born with like their entire life spelled out in their genes. Literally, social connection, especially in the first few years of life, makes the difference in outcomes. You can see it in three, four, and five-year-olds, those that have better attachment, and better attunement at home, those that haven't been abused at that age, do far better academically and socially in school. Even at very young ages than other kids do. And then it becomes cumulative. The brain on the right is a brain scan of a child that was severely abused and neglected. They looked at Romanian orphan orphans in Europe after uh, some political and social upheaval some years ago, 
And those kids that lost their parents and were put in these orphanages where they weren't tended to, held, loved, or paid attention to, and they were abused physically, sexually, emotionally. Literally, there was a, a, an effect on the structural growth of the brain of that child. So one of the things that's really important in order for the brain to function, it has to be well connected to itself. So when you're hungry, right, or you have an emotional reaction to something, your frontal cortex says, hold on, right? You have to socially interact with people. So what's your name? Daisy. Daisy was in my class at Adelphi. Substance abuse class, right? About two or three years ago? OK. So Daisy was in my class. If Daisy had a plate filled with pretzels, I'm, I really like I'm, I'm more of a salty than sweet guy. And I'm really hungry right now because I didn't eat lunch. I don't like to eat a lot before I speak. And I'm really hungry. My frontal cortex is going to say, you know what? I know you're hungry, but ask Daisy, would it be all right if I took a few pretzels? And you would say, she would say yes. It's because I gave you an A. Did I give you an A? OK, good. <laughs> this would be really. Um, that's the brain on the left. The brain on the right doesn't ask because it's not connected. It just takes the pretzels. And you're a parent, a teacher, a child care worker, and you're saying, you got to like, you got to be social. You got to you got to be courteous. Yeah. But this brain is not getting it. One quick thing about this. Trauma, neglect and abuse can damage brain growth. But it's not permanent because love and connection can heal it. So I want to make this very, very clear that this is not a done deal. You know? That's the ACE study. I encourage you, um, if you're working with anybody, you know, any age, look, at, look it up online. There's a ton of research on adverse childhood experiences that, that can be relevant to the work that you do. But here's what we know. The social environment helps create who we are. We're not just born a certain way. The idea of born bad, that's a really limited and narrow view of human behavior. We've got to expand it a little more. Those, again, who work in schools, if you're working with kids with conduct disorder, if you're working with kids with um, poor regulating behavior, those are the kids that grab and take and don't ask, or kids even with violent behavior, they are more likely to have suffered multiple traumas in their childhood. And we often miss it. You're busy. There's a lot going on. You've got hundreds of students in a school. You've got to tend to all that work. And then there's this one kid. And what we want to do is we just want the behavior to stop. And I get it. I'll tell you this. I teach at Columbia, and I teach at Adelphi in the graduate social work departments. I have the luxury of seeing my students once a week. People in schools, you see them every day. It's a completely different picture, and I get it. And the pressure is enormous, and people dump on schools and say, why can't you fix this kid? Because it shouldn't all be on your shoulders. It takes really a whole community. But one of the important, can I go over here? Am I allowed? Come on over. Hey, how are you? Thanks. Thank you very much. I like it over here. Thank you. How are you guys doing? What do you think so far? Is, this, is, is any of this information helpful or relevant to the work you do? OK, good, because I want to make sure that I'm giving you something that you can work with and you can use. The belief that genes are what determines us is a very narrow view of science. That's actually good news. Because to be honest, if it was just the genes, what could I do to help you? I'm a social worker. I've done, I used to work at a drug and alcohol rehab. Like I've done counseling with people who've engaged in really destructive, self-destructive, or outwardly destructive behaviors, people on probation, people on parole, all of that. And if, and if it was just their genes, what could I say to them? What's your name? Susan. Susan, what color eyes do you have? They, they are brown. Susan has very nice brown eyes. And you had those eyes when you were born. You had them when you were 10. You had them when you were 20. You're going to have them when you turn 30. Yes, she will when she turns 30. That's a fairly unchangeable genetic trait. Alcoholism, anxiety, bipolar disorder, suicidal ideation, all of these things are not simple genetic traits like that. 
You know, I can't talk somebody out of their genetic makeup. Not that I would want to. But understand that complex diseases and disorders, behavioral disorders that we deal with in schools, in clinical settings, and of course, prosecutors dealing with the crimes that these people end up sometimes committing. These are not things that are just pre-programmed into this person. And, and, and my argument is that's good news because we can change the trajectory. It didn't change for Ricky. Ricky was in South Oaks. Ricky was in other places. He was hospitalized, suicidal, put on medication after medication. But he lacked one thing. And that was a family that cared for him, loved him, and supported him. And listen, I'm not even getting, we don't have the time to get into it. I don't know what happened to them that they weren't able to give him what he needed. You know, but I'm a social worker, and I don't think anybody's just born evil. You know, that's me. I'm one of those, like, bleeding heart kind of, Renee and I have these discussions about this. You know, but this is me, and I get it. But I'm saying, I'm sure Ricky's father, Dick Casso, had his own chaos and hell that he grew up with. But here's the thing. That lack of intervention, helping this kid, resulted in the death of another child. And it turned the community upside down. Look, how far are we right now? You know, miles from Brentwood to a 20-minute, half-hour ride from here where MS-13 slaughtered four beautiful young children just a few years ago. There are shootings here in Nassau County as well, right? Made national news. This stuff wasn't just 30 years ago. It's happening today. You know, and my thing is, yes, the law is there to hold people accountable for their actions. But what really excites me is, can we prevent this stuff from happening? Because that's kind of where I want to look as far as the direction we need to go. People need to be attached to their parents when they're growing up or who their caregivers, anybody who their caregivers are. But we also need to attach to a community. Communities matter, right? And for the longest time, that was ignored. You know, human beings evolved like other primates as group animals, just like the rats I talked about. We like to be in family groups and community groups. For most of our evolution as a species, there was no such thing as a nuclear family. I had a friend that I met who lived in Kenya. She grew up there. And she said, Anthony, the hardest thing I had to adjust to coming to the United States was that nobody knows their neighbors here. She said, I grew up in Kenya in a village and there was a big backyard, and all these houses were attached to it in a circle. And most of the people living in that circle were my relatives, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles. And every morning, all the children would walk from house to house and say, good morning, auntie, good morning, uncle. We'd all go to school together, and we'd come home, and we had dinner together, all the families, almost every night. And when my mother was sick, Somebody took care of me because all the families helped each other. She goes, I just thought that was normal. That's not the way we live here. Families are stressed out. When you think about Long Island, think about this. There's a lot of people here who have very good jobs, making a decent stay, because it's not cheap to live here. And we're on our phones all the time. We're doing work at 10 o'clock at night, and we think it's a badge of honor. I just got to answer this email from my boss. I just recently left the job. My boss, I don't know. I have a non-disclosure agreement. But um, <laughs> he, let's just say there were nights when I got emails, like a dozen emails. And you just have to stop and think, like, I love my work. But we need balance. Now, Long Island is not the only place that this happens, but I think it's a really good microcosm. And what does it do to a family when parents are so overly stressed that they can't connect with their children the way, evolutionarily and naturally, that we're supposed to connect with them? What badge of honor is that when we can't love the people in our lives the way we need to? And sometimes the results are tragic. It came out pretty quick that, um, I, think, I think maybe day one, He'd been up in the woods for a couple of weeks and that uh, people had gone up to, to view the body. 
Show them the roundhouse. It's like, Rich, come on, I gotta tell you something. He said, I'll kill Gary. I'm like, bullshit. He's like, come on, I'll show you. I'll go up there. I'm gonna show you the bomb. I thought he was kicking my heart. So I said, all right, I'll go. Because I didn't think it was fucking true. And so we go up there. And it smelled like shit. It goes on. With the documentary, it'll come out on DVD called The Acid King, and it'll be streaming too. It's, it's worth watching. I've seen a preview copy, and it's intense. Um, more than a dozen kids in Northport went up to see the grave site where their friend Ricky had, been, um, had killed Gary. And there was Gary's body laying in a shallow grave covered by leaves, decaying for a couple of weeks. Out of those 12 kids who saw the body of their friend that they grew up with dead, only one told an adult. That always stayed with me. And by the way, the young woman who did was a neighbor of mine, somebody who lived around the corner from me. What about those other 10 or 11 kids? Why didn't they tell? And I think the answer lies a lot in this whole idea of social disconnection. They did not feel connected to their communities. Because people who feel connected to adults, who have good adult role models, who feel a sense of belonging where they live, you find out someone's been murdered, you're calling the police and you're going to your parents, whichever you do first. And you're doing it right away, because that's how I grew up. How did these kids see a crime like this and do nothing? You know, we know this too, law enforcement. Talk to law enforcement. Anybody law enforcement here? Right? And, and so one of the biggest things, especially with things like gang violence, is we need people in the community to come to us and talk to us about what's going on so we can respond before a really bad thing happens. When you have 11 kids that viewed a crime scene and not one of them told an adult or called the police, we can't just write that off. This happened in one of the nicest towns on Long Island. What happened that they didn't feel connected their, to their community? You know, I talk about the great disconnect. One of the things about this, we are the most connected society, ostensibly, ever in the history of humans, right? How many friends do you have on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter? Right? So now here's the question. How many of those friends can you call at 1 in the morning when you're in a crisis? How many of those friends will help you move? That's an even smaller <laughs> number. Right. If you got two or three, good for you. Everyone's heads are down in their phones. We're all walking around. And I'm not trying to be preachy. Listen, you know, I got my charger on me just in case I lose battery. I understand. But we need to connect more. There was a recent series of investigative journalistic articles in Newsday people might have seen in the past few weeks showing how racially segregated Long Island is. And oh my god, big surprise, it's not an accident. It's on purpose. But we've known that. Black and brown people have known it for generations. Robert Moses built the entire highway system to make sure, parkway system, that people who lived in the city and drove, rode on city buses couldn't come out to the beaches and parks on Long Island. We were built on racism. And by the way, white people, just a quick thing on that, just because that's our heritage doesn't mean we're racist, right? You don't have to be individually racist to benefit from it. You know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be down on white people. Some of my best friends are white. Um, <laughs> but I think it's important to be honest. So here we have all this social disconnection on Long Island, all this intense wealth. Some of the wealthiest communities in the United States are located right here on Long Island. I do not live in any of them. And we also are the 10th most racially segregated region in the United States, and we have to be honest with ourselves. I grew up, I went to a high school, I graduated from Northport High School, over 800 students in my graduating class, one African American. People would say, Northport's racist. I'm like, no, we treat our black students very well. <laughs> 
not, that's not normal. Right? And I was lucky. I grew up in a home where I didn't hear a hateful word out of my parents, thank God, that I grew up with you know, good values. But we have to understand that social disconnect and what it means. Because kids are growing up in an extremely stratified environment. And it puts a lot of pressure on us. The suburbs were where you got away from the urban decay. You know, oh, you don't want to go near the South Bronx, man. That's a war zone, blah, blah, blah. Yeah? Well, they just dragged a kid into the woods here in Northport. What is that? Is that the South Bronx? No, it's not. So, I mean, I know that, why did my parents move here? My, my father grew up in Washington Heights. My mom grew up in Harlem. Right? Love those places. They're awesome. But why? Why did they move here? Because it was like, this is a good place to live. There's so much great things. I love Long Island. I really do. I love the beaches. I love the parks. I ride my bike around. I love that I'm an hour from the city. If I want to go in and see a play or a concert, like there it is. There's a lot of good things about where we live, but there's a lot of stress here. There's a lot of emphasis on money and, and, and status. And I think that comes at a cost, and we just have to look at that connection. What does that stress do to families? How does it interfere with our ability to give children what we need to give them? An interesting thing about Northport, because I told you I grew up with those kids. There was a whole group of, at the time, this is like the mid to late 80s, of kids that looked like hippie kids. I mean, they would have the long hair and all. And they left Northport, about eight of them, and went on a road trip. Somebody had been somebody who had a farm in like North Carolina. And they went down to North Carolina and they lived on that farm for months and months and months. I remember thinking like, why did they do that? You grew up in this beautiful place. Why did you leave it to go, you know, 11 hours away and work on a farm? And some of them went back there and ended up living there. And the answer is they felt connection when they were down there at that farm. It's an interesting thing. Um, there's a book called Tribe written by a, a journalist who was embedded with a lot of military folks from the Middle East. And he talked about the importance of, of those clans and tribes and groups and why we need to be together. And there was some research showing that in frontier days, when Europeans were settling here, which is a nice word for it, um, and displacing Native Americans, there were times when Native Americans would capture the European settlers. When they looked at di diaries, they found out a large number of those settlers once they were returned to the European settlements on their own, went back to live with the Native American tribes. This is documented. Because there was connection there. There was social connection there. Living in a, in a society of hyper-individuality and hyper-competitiveness literally makes us sick and tears at the fabric of our social, our social connection. And if we think it has no result, we're missing the point. Families that are not supported have more trauma and abuse. Those kids who grew up with it have more drug abuse, mental illness, and violence. And we all pay the price. Thank you, madam. Pop the handbrake on for me, please. Morning. Good morning. Where's Philip this morning? Uh, Philip's not around anymore, I'm afraid, madam. Could I see your identification, please? <clears throat> what sort of identification do you want? I need to see your proof of residency, please, madam. Well, I've got my swipe card, but you've just seen me come out, so it's fairly obvious I live here. Right, yes, that's not acceptable anymore, madam, I'm afraid. I need to see your proof of residency for out here, please. Thank you. Just use this to come through the gates. Yes, I saw that, madam. Again, as I said, that's not in doubt. Um, uh, let me explain something to you. This, this is a gated community, yes? Here's the gate. Yeah. You're looking to now come into a non-gated community, so unless you show me proof of residency for out here, uh, I can't let you proceed. This is the street. It's public property. Madam, this is a non-gated community, yes? You don't want people in there, madam. Therefore, we don't want you out here. 
So unless you show me the relevant documentation, which I actually know you don't have, you won't be able to proceed any oh, further, madam. come on, this is you ridiculous. Can you just get out of the way? Can, Can you, you just get out of the way and please? let me no, go? No, could you back up for me, please? Could you just back up for me? No, madam, stop. You are trespassing. Can you just You've get out of the way, choice. please? Now you have to stick with it. In there or out here, I'm madam. I'm just trying to go in to the shops. In there or out here. Look, There's can you just get gate. out of the way, please? There's the gate. There's no, 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 no. You're not going any further. No, madam, I will not let you go any further. Can you just yeah, get out of the way, please? We don't need barriers. We don't need gates. Tear the gates down. <laughs> we got a problem. But you know what? It's one we created and one we can solve. How do we get more connected? One of the things that I, I'm going to throw out is I, I, I talked a little bit about the ACEs study and trauma and how it affects us, our neurobiology in this study, uh, in this presentation. Um, we are now in the process of training systems on trauma so that they're more aware and responsive so we can have better responses to these things and actually move forward in a way that creates a society that reduces the incidents of, of the things that I talked about today. Last year, I trained over 1,100 ju trial judges in New York State and the appellate division on trauma, family violence, and inequality. And I will tell you that judges literally lined up to talk to me after and said, we didn't know about this. This is new information. So this is exciting. I, we, we're training schools. If you work for a school, talk to me after. We'll, we'll have a conversation. Let's get your district trauma trained so that we can catch these problems sooner rather than later. Because I will tell you with trauma, it tends to not go away on its own. And we also need to have a conversation about what we need to do to make our society a better place. I will throw this out to you as I leave you with this. Sometimes people who are the most traumatized are the ones that have the most ability to transform society beyond that trauma. I think about the kids from Parkland. And instead, I mean, after what they witnessed, their friends getting murdered in front of them, instead of just sitting back and saying the world's a terrible place, they came together and said, we need to do something about gun violence. So I will challenge you schools, when those walkouts happen, please encourage them. I get it. You've got work to do. There's state requirements. I don't, I don't want to even begin to think about how much stress you're under with those things. But when people who suffer trauma and feel powerless and voiceless literally are able to coalesce together and speak up, that's what transforms society. Every major social movement was headed by young people. The civil rights movement, we look at that. Now the climate justice movement that's going on, Greta Thunberg is 12 years old and has accomplished more in her 12 years than I ever have in my, okay, 35 plus. So harness that power. Some of the kids you're working with who are the most difficult to reach, the ones that you don't think will ever accomplish anything, are actually the ones that actually might be poised to make a difference. One quick thing, I worked in a high school. I'll leave you with this thought. Some years ago, and one of the things I was asked to do for this youth agency was to run a detention program two days a week. We would have discussions with the kids. These were the kids that got caught smoking in school. Sometimes they would have, you know, stuff on them they shouldn't have had. They'd get in fights, they cut classes. Same characters every day. Staying after school for an hour and getting the late bus home because they had detention. And that same week, I remember the assistant principal saying to me, it's Thanksgiving coming up. And last year, the youth worker working for the agency you work at had a food drive. And we had boxes in all the classrooms, and kids brought in food for the hungry, because apparently poor people only need to eat once a year on Thanksgiving. And, um, and would you like to run you know, the food drive this year through the, the youth organization? I said, yeah, I'd love to. And then she gave me a list of kids who were still in school that hadn't graduated, who had participated last year. And they were all the theater kids and the honors kids. And I knew those kids. They were awesome kids. I put the list in my pocket. And she goes, contact them. So later that day, I had detention. And I ran the detention group. And I said to them, do you guys remember the food drive we had last year? And they said, yeah. I said, why do you think a community like this, nice North Shore community, ostensibly middle class, would need a food drive? And they said, because there's poverty in our town. And one kid talked about how his 
they had been foreclosed and evicted, and he had to live at his cousin's house and sleep on couches for six months. Another one talked about another family they knew that became homeless because of that, right there in these nice towns. And I said, well, would you guys be interested in running the food drive this year? And all the hands went up. I passed the list around, and I got 12 signatures. And the next day, when I saw the assistant principal, I gave her the list. And she said, well, what happened to the kids I gave you? And she looked at these names, and she was like, her? Him? These were the bad kids. These were the throwaways that they were like, her. And I said, yeah, you know, that other list you gave me, those kids are fantastic. But they always get asked. These kids never do. Listen, I don't want your jobs. I don't want to be a teacher in an elementary, middle, or high school. I don't think I'd be good at it. I don't want to be a prosecutor because I'd want to let everybody go. Thank God that's not what I do, except for the domestic violence perpetrators. But, but listen, I get your job is hard, but I, I do want to throw this other piece out. There's a backstory to everything. And that doesn't mean we don't hold people accountable. But if we could draw the circle in and make it bigger, if when people push back the most, we could respond with love and not disconnection, I think we could go a long way in making our neighborhoods and societies ones that were more livable and better places to be. Thank you for your time today.